Hey, good evening, ladies and gentle drunks. My name is Kevin Olson. I'm a recovered alcoholic. I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth dimension. Big book study, that is, uh, on uh, Tuesday nights. I'm very glad you guys are all here. I know I'm glad uh, I'm here. And uh, let's kick off, as we always do, with the set-aside prayer. God, please help me to set aside everything I think I know about you, about me, about my fellow man, about the 12 steps. And please allow me to gain a fresh new vision, perspective, and understanding of what you, what me, and what my fellow man and the 12 steps are all about. Amen. And uh, as this is the fourth dimension big book study, I always like to read the two parts of our book that refer to the fourth dimension. The first is on page eight. Bill Wilson writes, I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. And then on page 25, Bill Wilson writes that we have found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. I love it. We're going to be catapulted. We're going to be rocketed into this fourth dimension. Let's do it. I hope you guys will come with. Now, for the sake of tradition, everyone, please put one hand up like this. Everybody put another hand up like this. And everybody go, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I never get tired of that. Hey, guys, give me a minute. It's uh, it's very warm in my place right now. I'm just going to open a window, a little, little bit of cool breeze come through. Uh, but I want to ask uh, Vincent, my man, Vincent. Vince, hello. Uh, Brad cannot be here with us tonight. I was hoping you would be kind enough to uh, to read for us. Would you be cool with that? Yes, absolutely. For sure, Kevin. Appreciate it very much, Vince. Awesome. Vince rhymes with prince. You are a prince, my friend. You are a prince. Thank you for your help. Um, okay, well, uh, let's get started. Um, tonight, uh, just by way of review, a little bit, you know, last week uh, we learned about uh, a little bit about the history of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And really, in general, we learned uh, the three things that, that an alcoholic of my type needs to know in order to achieve um, recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. I needed to know what the problem is. I needed to know what the solution is. And I needed a program of action that I could take to overcome that problem to achieve that solution to help me over, uh, overcome the problem. And so I'm gonna share this with you guys right now. You can see it on the whiteboard behind me, but I'll also just share it here. You guys can see this, can you? Yes, problem. Our problem is the grave nature of alcoholism as outlined by Dr. Silkworth in the chapter of the doctor's opinion. Solution is a vital spiritual experience given to us on page 26 by Dr. Carl Jung, the renowned psychiatrist in the program of action is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous given to us by the Oxford group. Okay. Can anybody tell me, we learned this last week, who was the first person in the history of, uh, of the world to have access to all three pieces of this information at the same time? There were little oh, bits and pieces... Bill, Bill Wilson. Bill W. That's exactly right. Bill Wilson was the first man in the history of the world to have access to all pieces of this information. Uh, can anybody tell me, can anybody that is not Rob K., a renowned AA historian, can anyone else tell me when does Bill Wilson, we talked about this last week, when does he get this information? When and where is he when he gets this information? Anyone know? Anyone want to venture hospital a guess? The hospital. 34? The hospital. Yeah. Hospital at his home. So a, that's a good guess. It's a good guess. At, he gets at his house. He, at his, who said at his house? Who said that? There you go, Greg. That's exactly right. He's sitting in his kitchen. He's sitting Eddie. in his. He's sitting in his kitchen when Ebby Thatcher comes in and gives him, at this point, the. Uh, uh, the solution and the program of action that he had been given by Roland Hazard, who had been given, it had been given to him by the Oxford group and by Dr. Carl Young. What piece of information did Roland Hazard not have at that point? What piece of information does Evie Thatcher not have at that point? He doesn't know what the problem is. 
Okay, he doesn't know what the problem is. And we're going to talk in depth about the problem tonight. Bill Wilson had been given the problem by Dr. William D. Silkworth. Okay, uh, a renowned uh, doctor, uh, someone who is 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 accounted as one of AA's best friends, um, and uh, a great uh, supporter of Alcoholics Anonymous. Incidentally, I, I mentioned this last week, but I'm gonna I'm going to uh, mention it again. When we took take a look at uh, the problem, the solution, and the program of action, the problem comes to us from Dr. Silkworth. Is Dr. Silkworth an alcoholic? No, he is not. We get the solution, the vital spiritual experience from Dr. Carl Jung. Is Carl Jung an alcoholic? No, he's not. Nope. We get the program of action from the, the, the 12 steps. We uh, ultimately get them from the Oxford group. And we read the original six steps of the Oxford group last week. Are the Oxford group alcoholics? No, they are not. That was not their deal. Their deal had nothing to do with not drinking. Okay. Uh, the reality is that three non-alcoholic groups came together, and I think that God put them together uniquely, divinely, to um, to provide this solution to alcoholics of my type, because I think that God just got tired of seeing that alcoholics, alcoholics die from alcoholism. And so these three non-alcoholic groups come together divinely through Ebby Thatcher and Bill Wilson sitting in Bill Wilson's kitchen okay, one day, and Bill Wilson's still drunk. He's still drinking at this point, but he is given these three pieces of information, the problem, the solution, and the program of action. Tonight, we are going to read uh, one of my favorite chapters in the book, and I say that pretty much every time we start a new chapter in the book, that it's my favorite chapter, because uh, I love this book. I love this book very much. This book transformed my life. This book saved my life and changed my life. Um, we're going to read the doctor's opinion, and uh, we're going to see... Um, the, the medical estimate of the plan of recovery in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, we're going to read the uh, opinion of a medical doctor who worked with many, many, many alcoholics in a, a hospital called the Towns Hospital in New York City. And we're going to see what he observed and what his uh, opinion was about alcoholics, such as such as uh, our co-founder, Bill Wilson, in particular, our co-founder, Bill Wilson, and what he observed happen with this individual, Bill Wilson. So if you guys would, let's get into it. Vincent's going to read for us tonight, which is excellent. Thank you very much again, Vincent. We're back in the Roman numerals again, guys. We're going to be on page 25, Roman numeral 25. The page is XXV. X is uh, mean 10, and the V means five, Roman numeral 25, and uh, we're in the doctor's opinion. Again, this chapter, the doctor that we're speaking about here is Dr. William D. Silkworth, medical director of the Towns Hospital in uh, New York City uh, in, in, uh, between, in 1934. And in 1934, Bill Wilson went to the Towns Hospital three different times. He went early in the spring. He went then again later in the summer. And ultimately, uh, he... Uh, he went back into the hospital. He starts drinking again in November. He goes back into the hospital in December and had a life-changing experience in that hospital at that time. Okay. So with that said, guys, let's, uh, let's get into the doctor's opinion. And if you'd be kind enough to read, Vincent, we'll get started. Thank you, Kevin. The doctor's opinion. We of Alcoholics and Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. Okay, so I just want to point out here, guys, uh, that he is not um, just any run-of-the-mill doctor. Dr. Silkworth, his chief physician, he's chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction. So here's what happens. Dr. Silkworth had been a neurosurgeon, Dr. William Duncan. The D stands for Duncan. Dr. William Duncan Silkworth uh, had been a uh, brain surgeon, a neurosurgeon in the 1930s. Uh, in during the Great Depression, like so many people, even neurosurgeons were not immune to the Great Depression, and uh, and he lost his job. 
Um, but Dr. Silkworth had always had kind of a passion for alcoholism and, and a passion for understanding alcoholics. And so um, a hospital had been started by a man named Charlie Towns. It's called the Charlie Towns Hospital in New York City. And uh, um, he approached Dr. Silkworth and said, uh, would you like to come work in my hospital and uh, and and start attending to alcoholics? Um, and uh, Dr. Silkworth, having had a passion for alcoholism, said yes. That's something I would I would enjoy doing. And uh, to give you guys some indication of at that time how much money he was making, uh, this is not a guy who was getting rich working in this hospital. Okay, if you were to. Uh, uh, I, Adjust uh, for inflation, Dr. Silkworth was making the equivalent to $12,000 a year in today's money. That's how much he was getting paid to work at the town's hospital, okay? So I still believe that there was very much an altruistic aspect to what he was doing. Um, although he was getting paid for it, it's certainly not, you know, as much as he was commanding as when he was a neurosurgeon and so on. But he was probably grateful to have work. Uh, but also, I do believe that there was some divine inspiration in Dr. Silkworth, some compassionate uh, inspiration in his work and working with alcoholics. And so what we're going to see here is Dr. Silkworth's uh, estimate of what is uh, really going on with alcoholics. And Dr. Silkworth gives us what the problem is. He referred to it earlier. We referred to it in four to the second edition as the grave nature of alcoholism. We're going to expand on it today. Okay, and we're really going to nail down what is the definitive problem for the alcoholic, an alcoholic of my type. And uh, I just want to be clear, like what, what Dr. Silkworth observed in the hospital is really two things. He would see some people come to the hospital embarrassed, drunk, uh, defeated, and they would say those magic words, the alcoholics national anthem, I'm never going to drink again. And about nine out of 10 would leave the hospital and he would never see them again because the humiliation and the, the reckoning that had been given to them by alcoholism and their treatment in the hospital would be enough to keep them sober. And these are what we refer to as heavy drinkers in our book, okay? Heavy drinkers. They do not suffer from the same problem that I suffer from, okay? On the other hand, about one out of every 10 were what we refer to in Alcoholics Anonymous as real alcoholics. People like this individual, Bill Wilson, who would come to the hospital and say those magic words, I'm never going to drink again. And a month, two months, three months later, they're showing back up at the hospital again. And Dr. Silkworth could not figure out, Bill Wilson, what is wrong with you? How could you do this again? And he was as baffled as Bill Wilson was as to why this was happening. Then a third time, I mean, raise your hand. You can raise it digitally or you can raise it in, in, uh, in, uh, on, on video. Raise your hand if you ever have been to Alcoholics Anonymous more than once. Raise your hand if you ever drank again after coming to AA. Raise your hand if you ever went to more than one treatment center. I mean, that's certainly my story. I was not a guy who got sober once. And it was I was as baffled as anyone about why this kept happening over and over and over. And so Dr. Silkworth begins to develop this opinion, this theory about what was really going on with these alcoholics as he got to know individuals like Bill Wilson, got to follow their case and see what would happen to them. He began to develop, at this point, what we're just referring to as an opinion. Okay, this is just a medical opinion. So with that said, Vince, uh, let's start reading and we'll read through the entire letter, the first letter, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay. Sounds good, Kevin. Thank you. <clears throat> to whom it may concern, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient who thought he had been a competent businessman of good earning ca capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. And just to be clear, that individual that Dr. Silkworth is talking about, he's talking about Bill Wilson. That's who he's referring to right there. So you might want to make a little note there. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired 
certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his re rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. Okay, so uh, I, I, I just want to say he returns. So it says in the course of his third treatment, the third treatment, he comes back to the hospital December 11th, 1934. He starts drinking November, Armistice Day, November 11th, 1934. He starts drinking again. During the course of that time, Ebby Thatcher comes to his kitchen, okay, and they start to talk about this treatment of recovery. Uh, but Bill Wilson does not stay sober from that moment on. Bill Wilson goes back into the hospital. Ebby Thatcher then comes to the hospital to come see him on December 16th. 1934, December 16th, 1934, Ebby Thatcher starts to take Bill Wilson through these steps. On December 18th, 1934, Bill Wilson has his white light spiritual experience and leaves the hospital and uh, never drinks again from that moment on. And what he's talking about here is Ebby Thatcher gives Bill Wilson what he refers to as certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. From Ebby Thatcher, Bill Wilson takes the uh takes the um the treatment and starts to do the work and uh and then has to pass this on to others and this has now as dr silkworth says become this rapidly growing fellowship of men and women uh this man and over 100 others when we refer to alcoholics anonymous in the early days we often refer to the first 100 okay when we talk about who wrote the big book it was bill wilson that had you know, the pen in his hand to write it, but our book was really written by the first 100 members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's what he's, what Dr. Silkworth is referring to here. Back to you, Vince. Thanks, Kevin. I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid craving for liquor, and this often requires a definite hospital, hospital procedure before psychological measures can be ma of maximum benefit. We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Oh, hang, hang, hang on, Vince. Vincent, I think uh, Vincent, you've missed the page. Yeah, oh, we got, geez. we got. That's okay, buddy. That's all right, man. That's okay, Vince. These things, uh, these things happen. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, you missed uh, just the end of the letter there. So from page XXV to page XXVI, the top of the page should say "growth oh. inherent in this group." Yeah, my mistake. No, no, no problem, Vince. Uh, growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything. You may rely absolutely on anything that they say about themselves. Very truly yours, William D. Silkworth, MD. Very good, very good, excellent. Okay, so uh, a couple things here, guys. Um, uh, it says uh, these may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. Well, what does that mean? An, an epoch is just a segment of time. An epoch, yeah, a period of time made special by someone or something. Thank you, Rob. That's exactly right. It's an era. It's an era of time, okay? And uh, from the very beginning of time, people have been trying to find a solution to alcoholism. What was, can anybody tell me, what was the solution to alcoholism that the United States tried in the early 1910s and 20s? What was their solution to alcoholism? Anybody? Prohibition. Prohibition, exactly right, Alana. Prohibition. They tried to shut the thing down entirely. Okay, that's how big a problem it was, guys. Can you imagine? They amended the Constitution of the United States. That's a big deal. OK, 
okay? That's a big deal. That means it was a real, real bad problem in the United States, okay? And they tried it and it failed because even in the midst of that, they still, they couldn't control it, okay? They couldn't control it. And um, Oddly enough, so in terms of this, this era, they, they tried all different types of things, okay? So there's an epoch. There's a, this may mark a new epoch in the, the annals. Annals are just library stacks. OK, so what they're saying is in the library stacks, in, in the, the bookshelves in the library of all the books that have ever been written about recovery from alcoholism. The uh, uh, era, there's a new section of books there. OK, and this this new movement of these 100 men may mark a new era in the annals, the library stacks of alcoholism. Now it says these men may have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. Uh, you guys will come to learn as we go through this big book study, there are several lines in the book that I use as a benchmark to ask myself, how am I doing, okay? How am I doing compared to the first 100, okay? Because I believe that the spiritual message contained in this big book is divinely inspired, divinely crafted, and is the perfection of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I also know that I fall short of that perfection all the time, <laughs> okay? And what I want to do is try to align myself as closely as I can with the message in this book. I think that has everything to do with step six and seven, okay? Step six and seven, we want to attain the very best that God would have for us with an understanding that we're, we're never going to be perfect. OK, so when it says in this book, you may rely absolutely on anything they say them about themselves. That's what William D. Silkworth was saying about the first 100 members of Alcoholics Anonymous at this time in 1934. OK, 1939, actually, is when he wrote this letter. OK, so my point is, if you went and talked to my doctor, Dr. Collins is my doctor's name. If you went and talked to Dr. Collins, but Dr. Collins say to you about Kevin, you can rely absolutely on anything Kevin says about himself. OK, that's a good question. <laughs> Believe me, that's a good question. OK, but that is what I aspire to. That's the kind of man that I want to be. That's the type of person that God can lift us up to become in Alcoholics Anonymous, the type of person that anyone can rely on anything we say about ourselves. Now, it says very truly yours, William D. Silkworth, MD. And Rob already mentioned this, but in the uh, in the first edition of the big book, it did not say William D. Silkworth. The first edition of the big book, it said XXMD, okay? Because at this time, this was revolutionary. This was a revolutionary thing. Everything that William D. Silkworth is going to be sharing with us uh, about his understanding of the disease of alcoholism, as he sees it, is all theoretical at this point. It's all just opinion. It's all just based on uh, on on his observations, okay? If you fast forward now, 2023, uh, 2024, uh, we know exactly that he is absolutely right in all these things. The uh, disease concept of alcoholism has been absolutely affirmed. Everything that he's telling us is, is correct. Uh, the disease of alcoholism, though, is not accepted by the American Medical Association until 1956. 1956, uh, alcoholism is accepted as a, an actual disease by the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, um, now William D. Sokra says, OK, well, now now you guys can put my name in it. No problem. Now now he wants the credit for it. So in the uh, the second edition of the big book, uh, which actually comes out in 1955, um, uh, William D. Sokra says, you can start to to acknowledge me. You can start to put my name in there, which is exactly what happens. So uh, now this is the first letter that he gave us in the uh, the um, first edition of the big book, and really the, the, the first printing of the first edition of the big book. This is the letter as it was. In the second printing of the first edition of the big book, uh, he expanded upon this letter. And it's really the expansion upon this letter that has all of the information that we need, all of the information that we're going to share here, and really uh, has become the basis for really the foundation, one of the foundational elements of this big book study, one of the foundational elements of my 
home group, one of the foundational elements of how I sponsor new people, one of the foundational elements of how I take newcomers through step one, so on and so forth. So super, super important stuff. I'm very excited to share it with you guys. And um, uh, let's see what, uh, so now we're going back. Now it's Bill Wilson writing again, just to be clear, this is not Dr. Silkworth anymore. That's the end of Dr. Silkworth's letter. The first letter as it was, now Bill Wilson is going to tell us a little bit more about uh, about um, what they thought about what the doctor had said. Back to you, Vince. Thanks, Kevin. The physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality or were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to consider to considerable extent with some of us. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. Now, at this point, the physical factor has not been fully expanded upon. It will be fully expanded upon in Dr. Silkworth's letter. And we will certainly, over the course of this big book study, expand on things uh, in detail. Okay, you guys? So if you're if you're hearing this and thinking, like, I don't fully understand what they're talking about here with this uh, this physical component, just know that we're gonna we're gonna talk more about it. The doctor's theory is that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains that many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached, as he has then a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. The doctor writes. Okay, so this is now, this is Dr. Silkworth talking again. This is his expansion of the initial letter that he wrote. And uh, we're going to talk here about um, the physical, the physical component of the disease of alcoholism. What Dr. Suckworth refers to as the physical allergy, he refers to it as an allergy, which caused me no end of confusion when I was new to Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, and uh, we will go through the allergy and the the idea, the allergy model in detail. Um, and we'll be, uh, I'll, I'll try to shed some light and share some things and how I began to connect the dots and, and make sense of this allergy concept for myself. And, uh, and then most importantly, we are going to go through what Dr. Silkworth refers to what we refer to at primary purpose group as the cycle of alcoholism. And, uh, I'm very, very excited to share this with you. Some of you, I know have seen it many, many times because you've been to this study so many times. I'm so glad to see so many familiar, uh, friendly faces. Uh, and for some of you, it may be brand new. And, um, it was, uh, it was very illuminating to me. And, and I know it's been very, uh, powerful and meaningful for many people to understand what our problem is. Okay. Um, so very good. Back to you, Vincent. Thanks, Kevin. The subject pre presented in this book seems to be of paramount importance to those of afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years experience as medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. There was, therefore, a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is covered in such masterly detail in such masterly detail in these pages. 
we doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was urgent of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. What with our ultra modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. Okay, so one of the things that I want to uh, just point out about this reading is um, Dr. Silkworth is talking here about um, this this idea of moral psychology, okay? And uh, he'll refer later on as a uh, to a psychic change, okay? And he refers to many uh, ideas that are just outside the scope of spirituality, just outside the scope of God, okay? And uh, he's not quite willing to say spirituality. So he's seeing Bill Wilson. He's seeing Bill getting sober, taking this treatment, doing uh, the steps of the Oxford group, talking about spirituality, talking about God. But Dr. Silkworth is not quite ready to start reading about the writing about these things. OK, so he's going to talk about moral psychology. He's going to talk about a psychic change. Just know, guys. Okay, that when he's talking about moral psychology, we are talking about a spiritual awakening. When he's talking about a psychic change, we are talking about a spiritual awakening. We are talking about developing a relationship with God. Now, Dr. Silkworth doesn't want to talk about G to the OD. He doesn't want to talk about spirituality. Why do you think that is? Anybody? Anybody want to venture a guess? Mitesh? Because he, it... he might lose his job. Yeah, Angeli, he might lose his job. He's a medical doctor. He's a scientist. He doesn't know about all this spiritual stuff that this crazy Bill Wilson is, is, is on about, okay? And his life doesn't depend on it. He is not an alcoholic. He's a scientist. He's a doctor, okay? So this, this moral psychology that he's talking about, this psychic change, just understand, guys, and make no mistake that when we are talking about the treatment in Alcoholics Anonymous, we are talking singularly about one thing and one thing only, and that is a spiritual awakening. Spiritual awakening. Anything short of a spiritual awakening, and I am doomed to die an alcoholic death. That is irrefutable, okay? Dr. Silkworth is, is kind of choosing his words carefully. He doesn't want to talk about God. You know what? It makes me laugh because he even says, uh, we're not well equipped to apply the powers of good. He calls it the powers of good. He's got that one extra O there. He's not quite ready to call it the power of God. We talk about the power of God. Dr. Silkworth is going to talk about the power of good. And that's fine. We're very grateful to Dr. Silkworth for his friendship. But just don't misunderstand that we are not necessarily here to have a psychic change or apply moral psychology. Our book is clear. If all I needed to do was... Go to the New Age bookstore section and chapters and get a book on moral psychology. Everything, you know, that would be fine, but that's not the way it works for alcoholics of our type. My life depends upon having this spiritual awakening. So, uh, and he has seen this happen in Bill Wilson. He's watching this happen. One of my, uh, there's a, a psychologist by the name of Jordan Peterson, uh, who, you know, you may feel different kinds of ways about Jordan Peterson if you know who he is, you know, and that's fine. But he said something one time that really hammered home to me. He said, the, uh, the evidence for the existence of a spiritual awakening is irrefutable, but it is also inexplicable. I'm going to say that again. The evidence for the existence of a spiritual experience is irrefutable, but it is also inexplicable. Okay, so uh, I see some thumbs up. That's good. I'm glad I, I liked it too. Okay, we can see it. We can see it happening. And Dr. Silkworth right now can see it happening in Bill Wilson, but he doesn't know how to explain it. Okay, one of the ways somebody asked me one time, Kevin, what do you think God looks like? And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I'm not some spiritual guru, but I thought about, about that question. And uh, I asked, uh, uh, and what I came to is that I think God looks like a tree uh, that's blowing in the wind, okay? Uh, because we can't see the wind, but we can see the evidence of the wind in the tree. We can see the leaves blowing. We can see the branches blowing. And that's how God works for me. 
uh, I can't touch God. I can't see God, but man, I can see God every Tuesday night working in you guys. And I can see God every night working in my sponsees. And I can see God working in, in, in the leaves that are blowing in the branches in the trees. You guys understand what I'm saying? And what Dr. Silkworth is saying right now is he's seeing this guy, this leaf by the name of Bill Wilson, getting blown like crazy by something. And he doesn't want to call it God. He doesn't know, but he's just saying moral psychology, psychic change, whatever it is. Okay. So I just want to, I think it's really important to mention because I hear, uh, sometimes I hear people talking about they need to have a psychic change. And uh, I think it's it's important to note that what we need to do in AA as alcoholics that suffer from this disease, we are aiming at a spiritual awakening, okay? So uh, back to you, Vincent. Thank you. You're welcome, Kevin. Many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in this hospital. And while here, he acquired some ideas which he put into practical application at once. Okay, again, he's talking about Bill Wilson here. That's who he's talking about. One of the leading contributors to this book, he had some ideas that he got from maybe Thatcher and he put them into practical application at once. Later, he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here and with some misgiving, we consented. You know, I love that, guys. I love that. He's asking if he can go back to the hospital to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a privilege. It's a privilege, and I don't ever want to forget that. When I go to a treatment center, when I'm invited to a treatment center, when I'm invited to a homeless shelter, when I'm invited to any kind of place, any kind of podium, any kind of conference to go talk about the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a privilege. And Bill Wilson looked at it as a privilege. And one of the things, if you look in early AA, like, I, you know, I'm wearing a tie tonight. And I think we, you know, I, I wear a tie anytime I, I speak or I'm invited to speak, just like the early members of Alcoholics Anonymous did. Okay. Because when they were trying to go in to talk to newcomers at hospitals and at jails and so on and so forth, they needed to look respectable if they were going to be given the privilege of being allowed to go in and share the message, the good news of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? They didn't show up in, in track suits and construction clothes. Like we, and God bless us all, okay? We all worked very hard, but when we were taken uh, in early AA, uh, they needed to look respectable because to go speak to newcomers in a hospital, in an institution, in jail, as recovered alcoholics themselves, it was a privilege. And, uh, and they needed to treat it appropriately. Back to you, Vince. Thanks, Kevin. The cases we have followed through have been the most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The un unselfishness of these men as we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in this alcoholic field. They believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. Oh man, we almost got him. We almost got Dr. Silkworth there. Do you see how close he came? He even calls it the power, capital P power. We almost got him talking about God. We almost got him, okay? Capital P power. Okay, they believe in the power of Dr. Silkworth, man. It's irrefutable. He's seeing this stuff happen to these guys. Capital P power, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Lack of power is my dilemma. Okay, not lack of information, not lack of belief, not lack of knowledge. Lack of power is my dilemma. Okay, and Dr. Silkworth is seeing these guys lifted up by this power for the first time ever. And it is uh, inspiring, he says, to one who has labored long and wearily in the alcoholic field. He's seeing something turn on in these guys that he has never seen before. Amazing. Back to you, Vince. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. And this often requires a, a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifest, 
manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. All right, so let's let's talk briefly about this concept of uh, an allergy. Allergy to alcohol is what Dr. Silkworth calls it, okay? Uh, very confusing. <laughs> it was very confusing to me to be told that I had an allergy to alcohol, okay? And here's why. Uh, and I'm gonna, are you guys, are you guys ready for a little bit of just audience participation, okay? I'm gonna need you guys to unmute yourselves and help me out a little bit, all right? Is there anyone here on the call right now who is allergic to something other than alcohol? I know we're all allergic to alcohol, ha ha, I get it, okay? But really, Mitesh, what are you allergic to? Hello, I got hay fever. Hay fever, okay. And when you get hay fever, uh, how does that allergy manifest itself with you? Oh, teary eyes, blocked nose, and uh, lots of sneezing. Okay, so and is it safe to say teary eyes, blocked nose, and lots of sneezing is an unpleasant, dis uh, uncomfortable reaction? Is that safe to say? Absolutely. It's a negative reaction. Okay, very good, Mitesh. We'll take one more. Anyone else have an allergy other than alcohol on the call? Tom, I see your hand is raised. Yeah. I always wondered why I would itch so much after I moved the lawn. I'm allergic to grass. And the Perfect. worst allergy is cats. Per okay. And when you're allergic to cats, how does your allergy to cats manifest itself with you? My eyes would water and swell and almost look inhuman. Yeah. And is it safe to say that having watery, swelling eyes that look inhuman is a negative response? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm with it. I'm with it. Okay. So here's what Dr. Silkworth is saying. Dr. Silkworth is saying that our allergy to uh, alcohol manifests itself in a phenomenon of craving. A craving for what? Well, any alcoholic here would know a craving for more alcohol. That once I start drinking, once I, I kick it off, I have no control over the amount that I'm gonna take, okay? But here's what I needed to understand. Most of the time, when someone has an allergic reaction to something, it is a negative reaction, okay? A negative response. Although I do have an allergy to alcohol, the response that I have to that allergy is not negative. <laughs> In fact, the first time I took a drink when I was 12 years old and triggered that allergy, it was not a negative response. On the contrary, it was the single most positive response I ever had in my life, okay? It was transformative. And I had that electric feeling that the alcoholic has whenever we take a drink, okay? So although it is an allergic reaction, it is not a negative reaction. It was extremely positive, okay? As my grand sponsor Clancy says, it can't do it to you if it doesn't do it for you. What alcohol does for me as an alcoholic is not negative. It's extremely positive. You guys with me on that? Does that make sense? Although it's an allergic reaction, it is positive. And that's when I begin to understand a little bit more about this allergy. Because, you know, someone, someone would say to me, like, well, I'm allergic to milk. And when I drink milk, you know, I have this very negative allergic reaction. It's like, okay, great. And did you ever go buy a case of milk and lock yourself in a hotel room for four days and drink milk until you lost your job and destroyed everything you ever had? Like, no, no, that's not how it works. But yet we would do that with alcohol, wouldn't we? I mean, most of us, <laughs> okay. Well, why? Why? It's because that reaction, that allergic reaction was extremely positive. So I kick off that allergic reaction and I have no control over the amount that I'm going to take. And in fact, the more that I drink, the more that I want. Okay. Which explains to me why I'd be in the bar at two o'clock in the morning. They turn on the lights, the ugly lights, as we call them. Okay. And uh, that's it. That's all you are through it too. No more alcohol. Okay. You're done. That's it. Okay. 
And, and everyone else will be thinking about, okay, we're going to go home or we're going to go, you know, hook up or whatever it's going to be. And what was I thinking about at that time? What was I thinking about getting more alcohol, anything I could do anywhere I could go to go get more. There's only one type of person. Okay. So here's a, a test I like to do with alcoholics. Raise your hand. If you have ever bought off sales, if you know what off sales are, have you ever bought off sales after the bar closed at the end of the night? Okay. Yeah. Almost that's every alcoholic. About, that's what I liked about Calgary off sales. When I first heard that, man, I thought, holy shit. I have a mood, baby. Totally. Okay. Now let me tell you something. There are normal drinkers and moderate drinkers. Go ask them if they even know what off sales are, let alone whether or not they've ever bought them. They don't even know off sales. What's off sales. It's like, Oh, after the bar closes, we need to go buy more alcohol from the bar at like an extremely expensive price. They'll be like, why would you do that? That well, doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to them. Off sales doesn't make any sense to them at all. Every alcoholic here knows that because I've got so much going on in my system, I might've had 18 drinks, okay? But I need more. I don't need less. I don't ever get enough. The more I drink, the thirstier I get, okay? So then I'm the kind of guy at five o'clock in the morning after we drank all the off sales and all the off sales are gone and everybody's passed out. And, uh, and I just want to keep the party going because my biggest fear is that the party's going to end, okay? I've got that physical allergy. It has got me now. I don't have it. And I'm losing my mind, man. Okay. And I'm walking around and all the beer's gone. And I am the type of alcoholic that will walk around and drink other people's bottom beers. Okay. The beers that they've left behind that they didn't drink. Okay. And I know that there's people on this call who've done the same. And here's how I know. I'm going to ask you guys a question. What do I invariably get in my mouth without question as I tip one of those bottles back? Get a cigarette butt. You get a cigarette butt in your mouth. Now, here's the thing. If you knew the answer to that question, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. It may just be that you suffer from the physical allergy to alcohol because that is not normal drinking, okay? So guys, look, here's the reality. Uh, the allergy to alcohol manifests itself in a phenomenon of craving. Craving for what? Craving for more alcohol. The more I drink, the more that I want, okay? And once I start, there's a, there's a Chinese saying, uh, man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, and the drink takes the man. That is as good a simple definition of alcoholism as I know of. There's a joke that I like to make as well. Uh, for me to start drinking is like choosing to have, have uh, sex with a gorilla. It ain't over until the gorilla says it's over, okay? And in the meantime, I'm just in a lot of trouble, okay? I'm in a lot of trouble. Uh, and so that's uh, that's what alcoholism is like, okay? That's what Dr. Silkworth, good. I see some laughter. I see some laughter. That's good. That's what Dr. Silkworth is saying, okay? And this was, guys, understand, this is revolutionary. No one had ever had this theory, this opinion about alcoholism before. It was always about weak will, low morality, uh, bad upbringing, whatever it is. No one ever came up with this idea that physically, and he says, this is something that the alcoholic must believe. Bill Wilson says, we must believe that the physical aspect is just as important as the mental, okay? And this is fundamental to our understanding of why we drink the way that we do. Once I take a drink, I trigger this physical allergy that manifests itself in the phenomenon of craving, okay? Allergic to cats manifests itself in the phenomenon of, of, of itchy, watery eyes. Hay fever manifests itself in the phenomenon of itchy, watery eyes. Uh, uh, allergy to milk manifests itself in the phenomenon of getting sick and, and whatever. As an alcoholic, my allergy to alcohol manifests itself in the phenomenon of craving for more alcohol once I start drinking. And this is key to understand for the alcoholic. Okay, And an Alcoholics Anonymous, this is something that we absolutely believe. And it is something that when I'm working with sponsees, I want to absolutely qualify and understand and make sure that they understand the physical allergy and that they identify with the physical allergy. I'll tell you guys a story. I took on two new sponsees at once. And I took on a guy who I, who I sponsor to this day. He's sober to this day. He's on fire. He's one of the best members of my home group we have right now. I love this guy. His name is Derek. And I, I took him on that day. And on that same day, uh, I took on another guy. Uh, who his name is Jason, but Jason, on contrary to being an alcoholic, believed he was just a crystal meth addict. Okay. 
And I smile and nod because I get a lot of guys who think, no, 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 my problem's crystal meth, my problem's just cocaine, and and I don't have uh, I don't have alcoholism. Okay. And usually, if I sit down with our book, I can help him to catch a case of alcoholism. Okay, uh, alcoholism is a disease, and it enters through the ear in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can usually help guys identify, but I'll never forget this. Uh, we're sitting in, in a treatment center. We got this book open, and I give these guys the, two, the same two questions that I ask you. Okay, uh, hey, did you guys ever buy off sales after the bar closes? Right, and Derek that I sponsor to this day is like, oh my God, so many times I spent so much money on and on. Crystal meth addict is like, what's off sales? I was like, huh. Then I asked the same question that I joke with you guys about, hey, what do I invariably get in my mouth? And Derek's like, oh my God, a cigarette, but I know me too so many times. And then like, you know, blah, 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 blah. The crystal meth addict was like revolted <laughs> that, that you would drink and get a cigarette butt in your mouth. He did not identify with the physical allergy to alcohol. He didn't get it. So what do we do? What do we do in a situation like that? I help him to find a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous. I believe that, okay? It's important because I think, and I don't know why this is controversial, but it is. I, I think that you need to be an alcoholic in order to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? I don't know what, what that became very controversial not long ago, okay? I don't know why, uh, but but it is. Now, some folks will point to the third tradition and say, no, 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 the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. And if I'm a crystal meth addict and I have a desire to stop drinking, I can be a member of the fellowship, right? Well, let's look at the long form of the third tradition. What does it say? Our fellowship ought to include all those who suffer from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Our fellowship ought to include all those who suffer from alcoholism. So why do we have the singleness of purpose in AA? Why? Why does it matter? Why can't, it's all just one big disease, isn't it? Why can't we have, and this is an open meeting. I'm, I'm very happy for friends who are here and learning about the big book that might be in Gamblers Anonymous or Overeaters Anonymous or al or whatever it is. You're all very, very welcome here, okay? And I'm glad you're here. But in terms of alcoholism, why is it necessary that to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, we insist that you be an alcoholic? Here's why I think it's important. If that crystal meth addict gets sober in AA and becomes a solid member of Alcoholics Anonymous, God bless him. At some point, it is assumed that he is going to go out on a 12-step call to an alcoholic. And the problem there is that there's going to be zero identification because that crystal meth addict does not understand how an alcoholic drinks. And therefore, when there is no identification, there will be no message conveyed. And that alcoholic might die drunk because we sent someone to go see him that does not have the disease of alcoholism. You guys with me on that? It makes no more sense than sending a gambling addict to go talk to an alcoholic or, or, or anyone else. Yes, we understand the feelings and all that stuff. But they don't understand how we drink. Okay. Nor do I understand anything about crystal meth addiction or or gamblers uh, or gambling or anything else. Okay, so anyway, I just mentioned that, guys. This physical allergy, I think it's important to understand uh, that I have it and to qualify the guys that I sponsor to make sure that we're we're making sure that the people who are becoming members of Alcoholics Anonymous and the guys that I sponsor understand and identify and and uh, have this physical allergy to alcohol. Okay, let's keep going, you guys. Back to you, Vince. Thanks, Kevin. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. Absolutely. A power greater than ourselves is a message of depth and weight. The idea that God conquers alcoholism is a message of depth and weight. The idea that we have a program of action that I can do to, get, to attain a solution to overcome the problem is a message of depth and weight. 
just go to meetings and don't drink even if your ass falls off is not a message of depth and weight. 90 meetings, 90 days, or we'll refund your misery is not a message of depth and weight. Okay, a message of depth and weight is one grounded in a power greater than ourselves, grounded in spirituality with the promise that we have a program of action that anyone can do to attain this solution, to overcome this problem. And that I am personally here to help you do that program of action and to teach you how it's done. That is a message of depth and weight. Back to you, Vince. Thanks, Kevin. If any feel that as psychiatrists, psychiatrists directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand with us a while on the firing line. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become part of their daily work. And even if they're, and even of their sleeping moments, and the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up amongst them. Okay, guys, so we're we're uh, going to go over a little bit on time today. If you can give me probably another 10 minutes, we should be done. Uh, I just want to get you guys an introduction to the cycle of alcoholism because I think there is really, in terms of step one, there's nothing more important than understanding the cycle. We'll certainly uh, expand upon it next week, uh, but I want everyone just to get a, 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 just a beginning understanding of the cycle of alcoholism. So on page XXVIII, I, I, I want you to make a little star beside the, uh, where it says men and women drink, okay? And this is where Dr. Silkworth gives us the real essence of our problem. When we talk about the grave nature of alcoholism, brothers and sisters, this is it. This is it, okay? And one of the things I tell my sponsees to do, uh, I don't ever want to rewrite the big book in, in any way, and I'm not doing that. I'm really just saying this to, to clarify something that confused me. When Dr. Silkworth is talking here about men and women drink, he is not talking about normal drinkers like my mom and dad. He's not talking about Alan and Carol. He is talking here about alcoholics. So just to clarify, I ask my sponsees to cross out where it says men and women and write alcoholics there. I want you guys to understand that Dr. Silkworth is talking about alcoholics right now. Okay. We're going to read through this cycle. I promise I'm not going to interrupt. Okay. And then... Uh, and then we are going to, uh, we're going to expand upon it uh, a little bit. I'm going to show you guys a visual that we use at my home group. And I'm going to show you guys how I use this tool with sponsees, how I use this to qualify myself as an alcoholic and how I use it to qualify my new sponsees as alcoholics as well. And I've done this hundreds of times with hundreds of men. And uh, it is a very, very, very effective process. I've taught it at this big book study for 15 years. And uh, it is, uh, it's a powerful, powerful tool. And I'm, I'm excited to share it with you. We'll do it very quickly. We'll be done at 10 after seven today. And if you need to drop off, my feelings will not be hurt much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented, unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. 
Okay, so again, I just want to highlight there, you know, he says psychic change, psychic change, unless this person can experience a psychic change. And I want to remind everyone, when he talks about a psychic change, what are we talking about in Alcoholics Anonymous? As alcoholics, what are we talking about? We're talking about a spiritual awakening, okay? So here's what I want to do, guys. And this is something that I developed uh, many, many years ago in this big book study. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'll, I'll share it with you. It has become uh, the basis of how I work with sponsees. As I said, we actually at my home group have, we've got the 12 steps, we've got the 12 traditions, and then we have an outline of this cycle up on the wall as well. We just started doing that a little while ago, and I think it's great. So um, this is what we refer to as the cycle of alcoholism. This is what we just read written out in a visual interpretation, okay? So what Dr. Silkworth says is that we are restless, irritable, or discontent unless we can again experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks, okay? He also says that we are unable to distinguish the true from the false. Our alcoholic way of life seems the only normal one. We are unable to distinguish the true from the false. And once we take that drink, once we believe the lie, that we need to take a drink to uh, to um, uh, find relief from this restless irritability and discontent. And we take that drink to get that sense of ease and comfort. What happens? We trigger the, trigger the physical allergy. We trigger that craving. We enter the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. And this is repeated over and over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change or spiritual awakening, there is very little hope of his recovery, okay? So this is the cycle of alcoholism. I swear off, that's it, I'm done, I'm through, I'm, I'm gonna control my drinking. I'm, I'm not gonna drink hard alcohol anymore. I'm gonna move to a new city. Okay, I'm going to try lots of different ways to control my drinking. And then ultimately, every alcoholic at some point will say the magic words, I'm never drinking again. I'm never drinking again. And what happens? What happens is that during this period of sobriety, during the period of sobriety, I become restless, irritable, and discontent, filled with resentment and fear and guilt and shame, and self-loathing, and anger, and hatred, and all the good stuff of the disease of alcoholism, okay? And ultimately, what happens is my mind lies to me. I am unable to distinguish the true from the false. We refer to this as the mental obsession or the insanity of alcoholism. I used to think the insanity of alcoholism was the crazy things that I did when I was drinking. That is not the case. In Alcoholics Anonymous, when we refer to the insanity of alcoholism, I'm singularly talking only about the insane thought that precedes the first drink. And let me ask you guys a question. Am I drunk when I have that thought or am I sober when I have that thought? I am stone cold sober when I have that thought. And that should be horrifying to me because that tells me that drinking is not my problem. Drinking is my solution. What I'm looking for is a sense of ease and comfort to overcome this problem. I don't have a drinking problem. I have a restlessness, irritability, and discontent problem. We refer to that as the spiritual malady, the spiritual sickness. So I take that first drink to get that sense of ease and comfort. What happens? Again, I trigger that physical allergy trigger the phenomenon of craving for more alcohol. I enter the well-known stages of a spree and a spree guys can be a day. It could be a week. It could be years. I went out drinking one night for three years is what happened. Okay. We enter the stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization with a firm resolution not to drink again. So when I work with sponsees, the way that I have my sponsees do step one is I will say to them, I want you to find five stories from your own life that match this cycle. Not your life story, five times that I swore off, became restless, irritable, and discontent during the period of sobriety, 
had an insane thought in sober, had this insane thought that told me to pick up a drink and I want to zero right in on exactly what were you feeling and what were you thinking? Because this, guys, this is the unmanageability of alcoholism. The unmanageability of step one is not what happens when I drink. The unmanageability of step one is the way that I feel and the way that I think before I pick up a drink. That is why I will always return to drinking. Step one is not a declaration that I'm never going to drink again. Step one is a declaration that I am absolutely guaranteed to drink again as an alcoholic because my feeling and my thinking is absolutely unmanageable by me. I believe the lie. I pick up that first drink to get that sense of ease and comfort, trigger the allergy, and I'm gone. Okay. And I'm not so interested in the first drink and what happens during the spree. I don't want to hear that from my sponsees because we all know about that. That's uniform. That happens to everyone. What I'm most interested in is starting here and what attempts to control or stop drinking entirely did they make? What happened during the period of sobriety? How did they feel? What was the insane thought that they believed? What was the exact thought? And then they pick up a drink and they're gone. This is the part that I'm most interested in from my sponsees because this is the crux of the problem. The physical allergy is not my problem as long as I don't believe the lie. Now, over the next many weeks, guys, we are going to do, uh, and, our, and our book does an excellent job of explaining the thinking of an alcoholic, the, the insanity, the mental obsession, the curious mental blank spot, the peculiar mental twist, the desperate experiment of the first drink is what our book talks about in detail and in, in the chapter more about alcoholism. We are going to go through that together. We'll talk about it together. The thinking that precedes the first drink. But this is what I do with my sponsees. So I'm going to give you guys uh, an example from my own life. And now next week, what I want to do when we kick off is I want everyone to be ready to be prepared to have one or two uh, stories of your own ready in case uh, I, I ask you to share one of them. Okay. So I want everyone to be mindful of, of, of this cycle. Think about it for yourselves and think about how this applies to your drinking. Here's an example of a story from my own life. Okay. I had uh, been to a treatment center. I went to a treatment center called 1835 House. I went to that treatment center and I was six months sober. Um, I went, uh, you know, and it was fine for a while. And I did the deal for a while. I left that treatment center. I got a job as a server in a restaurant. I stopped doing AA. I stopped going to meetings. I didn't talk to my sponsor. I wasn't doing anything there. I started to convince myself that uh, at this new job that everyone hated me, nobody liked me at this job, but screw it, I didn't like them either. And I hated them all, okay? And this guy came to me and gave me a big handful of cash for tips that I had, and I had a thought. I didn't have a drink, you guys. I had a thought. And my thought was, screw these guys, screw this job. Nobody likes me here, but I don't like them anyway. I need to just take the edge off tonight. I'm going to go and just have six drinks, just six drinks tonight. No big deal. Okay. I went to get that sense of ease and comfort. I had those six drinks that night. And then of course I had many, many, many more drinks. And that night I got thrown out of several bars. I was physically beaten up. I was beaten bloody and uh, I lost my job that night. I mean, not, it wasn't that night. I mean, I went drinking for days, okay? What was supposed to be six drinks to take the edge off became days and days of drinking. And I emerged remorseful, of course. And uh, that was actually the last, the last night that I ever drank, which was February 18th, 2001 is the last time I took a drink. Um, and so that is, uh, that's an example the time that I had sworn off when I went to that treatment center, I stopped doing AA. I got crazy again, picked up that drink and went nuts. Okay. Same thing. I'll give you one more example. I, uh, I was in university 
And uh, I knew that I had a problem with drinking and I was really trying to control it. I was very anxious about some tests that I had to do. And I remembered, I had this thought. I remembered a professor of mine saying, you know, the night before a final exam, it's not good to study too much. You need to take, take a break, go see a movie or something like that. So what was my thought? My thought was, I'm going to go to a bar and have a beer. I'm going to go to a bar and just have a beer. And I went to the bar, just one, Allie, just one. I went to the bar and I had a schooner. Do you guys know what a schooner is? Okay, the big, yeah, because that's one drink, right? That's one. And I drank that whole thing and I triggered that allergy. And that night uh, I was soon drinking tequila with my new best friend because he was buying. I passed out in the parking lot, came to late for the final exam the next day. And, and I remember my firm resolution that day, driving in my car in the middle of winter, punching myself in the head, saying, how could you have done this again? Never again, never again, okay? And suffice to say, that was, that was not the last time that I drank. In fact, I was drinking the very next day, okay? So this is what I wanna do. And I do this with all my sponsees. This is where we start, a time that I swore off. That's it, I'm done, I'm through forever. I'm not gonna drink again triggered the physical out or uh, uh, became sorry became restless irritable and discontent in sobriety had an insane thought and i wouldn't want to zero in on exactly what that thought was i want to know what the voice of alcoholism sounds like in my mind then i take the first drink and the rest is is uniform for all of us okay so that is the cycle of alcoholism. I cannot underscore how important this is in terms of my understanding of step one and how I work with sponsees uh, in, in developing this story and uh, the many, many uh, dozens, hundreds of men that I've taken through this and uh, how important it's even become at Primary Purpose Group. We've got it up on the wall. So that's it, you guys. I would love it if uh, you all had at least one story to share next week. And uh, we'll